Hi, Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Uh, well, I think we've reached an aesthetic and substantive low. I sort of look like Robert Klein in the underworld. Um, you know, I, I think I'm you blue. look a little like Robert Klein. So they say. And, and uh, the, tell me, are, are you away from home at the moment? I am away from home. And when you're away from home, do you get blue? I do, but I'm especially blue today because we're using a um, camera that you supplied me, Bob, that makes me look awful. That made me look Thank blue you. last week when I was in Palo Alto, yeah, looked, but now you're on the road and you get to use yes, it. Yes, you looked awful. Um, anyway, it's all very exciting, but um, isn't, you know, going to get... But you know, it's funny, the Robert Klein thing I had never noticed. You do look a little like Robert Klein, who probably is unknown to about 50% of our viewers because he hasn't been that visible in the last, say, seven or eight decades, right? Right. People used to tell me I looked like Elliot Gould in Little Murders, and then they told me that that wasn't a compliment. <laughs> uh, I, not having seen Little Murders, I don't know whether it is or not. Uh, I don't. I don't see the Gould thing, but I see Robert Klein a little. Okay. Um, um, now, now he is still alive, right? He's a living stand-up comic. I think so. Yes. As opposed to. As opposed to. That was a segue. As opposed yeah. to, say, George Carlin. Yes. You wanted to talk about George Carlin. I, uh, not a, I, I just thought we shouldn't pass up the opportunity. To, we do obituary so rarely, and we did Tim Russert last week, so it just seemed like we were on kind of a streak. I didn't have that much to say to him. Do you, do you have things uh, about him? Do you have things to say about him? No, I used to think I saw him at the 7-Eleven, but then I realized that everybody at the 7-Eleven looks like George Carlin. So <laughs> uh, I don't know whether I saw him or not. Um, this was in, in his hippie phase? These people resembled This was recently, no. Yeah. So oh, like, I see. Like six months ago. I see. Um, uh, well, here's go ahead. my feeling about George Carlin. Yes. Um, I guess there's, uh, there's kind of, I, I think there's maybe a side of him that I don't approve of, but there's a side of him that I really, I really was impressed by. And that, I guess, was exemplified by this Muhammad Ali thing he did, you know, the riff where he would say... Um, you know, the, the, uh, with regard to Ali's, uh, you know, draft evasion conviction. Right. Um, you know, Muhammad Ali likes to beat people up, and the government said, we want you to go kill people, and he said, that's where I draw the line. And they said, well, if you're not going to kill people, we're, we're not going to let you beat people up, and so on. Yeah. It's very, he did it a lot better. It was a great riff. You know, purposeful, had a point, you know, used irony and humor to, to kind of make the point. To kind of underline what, when you think about it, really is the a kind of absurdity, which is when there is a draft on, the government has the right to say to you, you have to go kill somebody you don't know or we will put you in jail. And when it's in a war like Vietnam that was not a war of necessity, it's, you know, all the more absurd. So anyway, I that, think that, he, I think he, Ali was offered conscious objector status, wasn't he? I mean, he could he No, no, I think he, I think he sought conscientious objector status. I don't think that's right. But. Really? I don't, well, think anybody, I don't think anybody was making him go kill people. I think if he didn't want to kill people, he didn't have to kill people. Well, no, he could go to jail. That's what he did. The government has the power to do all sorts of things. There's a, there's a big debate over the shield law, whether the press should be exempt from compulsory testimony. But when you think about it, there's something creepy about the government compelling anybody's testimony, not just the press. Uh, I'd kind of rather them do that than hand me a gun and tell me <laughs> to kill somebody, actually. But... Uh, anyway, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of things you could argue about whether the government should be able to do or not. My point is just that, in this case, it seemed to me he had succeeded in underscoring the argument, you know, the sensibility that works against uh, the government's, you know, being allowed to do that. So I would call that successful, purposeful yes, stand up. Yes, he was a successful and inoffensive propagandist for. Well, whatever. For, for quite. But what uh, I would the thing causes. I'm not so sure I'm in love with is the thing he's most famous for, which as you know is... The seven dirty words. The seven dirty words you can't say on TV or radio. Now... And I only know one of them John McCain allegedly said. Oh yeah? Which one is that? The C Can't say it. The C word. Ah, 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 ah. I can't... <laughs> can't. Ah, 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 Mickey! I didn't say anything. Go, go ahead, go ahead. It's just the internet. <laughs> um, there, there's a very... There's a parody on the internet of... of, of the press trying to decide whether to cover John McCain's alleged use of the C word. But, um, the what word? Sorry? C? Yes. Huh. Um, so, um... <laughs> the experts are baffled. Uh, um, 
The, I think uh, it's, it has to be one of the seven dirtiest words. It's the most disgusting word in the English language, maybe. Well, interesting. interestingly, the well, actually, there's two, <laughs> Mickey, there's two candidates for that that start with C that are, have a certain symmetry between right, them when right, you think right. about it. But I don't actually, really want to go too far into this. Actually, at the slave retreat, I learned some more disgusting words that are even more disgusting than those words. But Mickey, would they print them in Slate? No way. That's the difference between them and blogging heads. Have at it. No way. Come on, Mickey. Absolutely not. What, uh, the, Don't be MSM. Slate is so MSM. The retreat, you know? the retreat. That's the thing. They try to be edgy, but they're really MSM. The retreat was at Mohonk, and what happens at Mohonk stays at Mohonk. Stays in Mohonk. Absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, so. so anyway, the thing about the seven, maybe there was a serious argument. There is a serious argument to be made about whether the government should, in fact, have had the right to keep certain words off of the airwaves. You know, this was an issue that arose in a kind of peculiar phase of technological history when there was this limited bandwidth and so on. Um, well, tell, but, it, tell it to Nancy Pelosi. She wants to reimpose the Fairness Doctrine. The only justification of that, I think, unless the Democrats are, are real, have really moved into dangerous territory, is the scarcity of broadcast resources, which is the same argument that's used to justify banning the seven dirty words. They're going to require that, I don't know, Rush Limbaugh be balanced by Josh Marshall. I don't know what they're going to require. But. Yeah, but the point is that that, that's, uh, that argument only holds so long as we're talking about true radio, and increasingly the radio is actually comes through you s through some means other than right. radio. So, so why don't the Democrats get wise to that? Why are they clinging to this outmoded censorship model? I don't understand it. I don't know what, what well, I don't know, I don't know the story you're talking the about. The story is that it's a big story. The Democrats are upset that Right wing dominates talk. The right wing dominates talk radio, and left wing attempts at talk radio have failed, like Air America. So the second fallback, just as with the union car check, is to pass a law that changes the that tilts the playing field further left by reimposing the fairness doctrine, uh, which I believe was allowed to. But last. they wanted to apply to like the internet and stuff. No, no they wanted to apply. I don't to think so. I, don't, I wouldn't put it past them. But I, as far as I know, it's well, only. Well, obviously, only they're just trying to get a little advantage out of. Well, you know, a quirk in the law, and well, that's the sort of that's what politicians do. That's the sort of advantage that Vladimir Putin tries to get that advantage every day. We don't respect him for it. So, Mickey, you know, I mean, the show is young, and already you're dissing Democrats in a seemingly gratuitous and tangential fashion. I mean, I when, I, so when I say the words Richard Pryor, you know, Nancy Pelosi just does not spring to mind. But you, you made this connection. That was that was impressive. I thought it was George Carlin. What did I say? Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor. You've well, easily the confused. The issue of race is inescapable in America. What? The issue of race is inescapable in America. I think that shows how, how indifferent I am to it, the fact that I got them mixed up. Uh, that could be. Um, anyway, I digress. I, what I was going to say was I would disapprove of the seven dirty words thing if its only impetus was this very common kind of motivation in stand-up comedy, I think, which is the idea that transgression of norms is a good in and of itself, and that the comic's job is just to push the envelope, regardless of, of what part of the envelope or where it's heading, right? Yeah, that's yeah, although, a common sensibility. Although the transgression of norms is, is one form of comedy that could be very, very funny. It can and be useful. funny, and sometimes it can be purposeful. But but there is, what I'm thinking of is, you know that movie, The Aristocrats? Remember that? I didn't see it, because I heard it was Okay, but it was all about this joke that's too dirty to yeah. be told, but the comics always tell one another. It involves incest and excrement. Yeah. I forget the yeah. joke, actually, even though I saw the movie. But in that movie... Maybe that was the joke they were telling in Mohawk. I could remember, be. I forget. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. You want to tell no, that joke? No, no. I tell it. Um, the, uh, and, 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 and the point, there was no kind of point in... In that joke, the idea seemed to be, the idea behind that film was, look, if people are uncomfortable with something, uh, if people, you know, think it's bad to say, well, then you should say it, and you should make them uncomfortable. And I just think that's wrong. I think, you know, some norms, for whatever reason, make sense. In the case of incest and excrement, I just think so many people find it gross, and gross for kind of deeply biological reasons that it's like, what, what, what's the point of pushing that particular envelope? But... Um, uh, there, is a, there is an irony here, which is that if you see that movie, the only guy in the movie who does, in my view, a truly funny job of telling the story, the only guy who had me in the aisles laughing was George Carlin, huh. which, which gets at, to the point 
that uh, Seinfeld made in this New York Times op-ed today, which is that he was a true craftsman. I mean, the guy knew how to, he knew how to tell a joke. Um, and he didn't live long enough to be on blogging heads. You know, it's, a, it's regrettable. It makes you wonder that's who a, else we should, we should capture on camera before it's too late. We should make a list. Um, uh, th that, that is interesting. Uh, well, yeah, but, but, but anyway, uh, um, he mostly, I mean, I think, I, I, I think it was mainly the kind of purposeful comedy that would pass my strict assist, or sheer harmless absurdism, like, you know, the newscaster saying today's baseball scores are 5-2, to 3-1, right, right, right. and so right. on. It um, was funny at the time. It was fun. It's funny now. It's just funny now. You're, you don't have his joke-telling skills. Um, no, I don't. Uh, anyway, he was a craftsman. Um, people are dying right and left. They violated the rule of three. It seems like four people have died, but anyway. Who else died? Uh, Tim Russert, uh, Stuart Mott, and there was one other person. Anyway, hmm. at least one well, other person. Perhaps we can do somewhere. them next week. Um, uh, what is this turning into, like, George Stephanopoulos, where we have In Memoriam? Yeah, we will be putting some music uh, over this part of the... Um, so what's next? You, I don't know. You, you, know, you want to talk about torture? No, let's, uh, let's save torture for the okay. bitter end. Okay. You, want you wanted to talk about Obama's vice presidential... A oh. uh, couple of points. Um, uh, I... I, 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 I I've had heard from several sources that Edwards really is a serious, uh, he's being seriously considered. I, he's also not trying to get the job, uh -huh. uh, I don't think. And, he's told and you can't think about any personal details in his, in his life that would complicate things if they did pick him, can you? Um, a few, mainly one. Um, it just see, uh, anyway, 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 I would be horrified if, if they actually... Yeah, because it's your it's your thesis that he uh, recently uh, uh, there was a child born to him out of wedlock within like the last six months. That's yes, your thesis, yes, right? That's my thesis, and uh, it, well, it was. I mean, the, the paternity was claimed by somebody on his campaign, so it's either him or the campaign aide. Uh, well, in that case, a simple paternity test, I believe, would determine the truth. Yeah, but you're the so, only one clamoring for it. <laughs> maybe maybe he'll pay for it. Um, I don't think the question is who pays for it. I think the question is. Who gathers the DNA? Yeah, isn't it? I don't know. Anyway, uh, so that was that was horrifying. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I just was. I've been talking with. I've been getting into the Veep stakes. I hate the Veep stakes. It seems so secondary, but at, at some point. Yeah, I got to say, our commenters have been complaining about the amount of horse race politics right. that's done right. on well, blogging well, heads. I, okay, but go ahead. Um, first, there was a good Bob Beckel piece on Hillary. Uh, that you can get to in Real Clear Politics. We'll link to it. Um, he does a pretty good job of saying that she would help the ticket. Where it falls down is on the question of would she be loyal. Uh, it, it, it says, well, of course she's going to be loyal because her success will be linked to Obama's. Well, it is at the beginning, but I could see halfway through the term, if Obama's initiatives fail and she thinks she could do it better or wants to position herself as the person who could have done it better, you could have sort of a West Wing situation where there would be uh, tension between the vice president and the president. And I, I disagree. Okay. I disagree. Well, once she's on the ticket, see, I think she has the, the incentive to undermine him before the election because because then she'd have a shot in four years. I'm saying once she's elected, two years in the I know. The term. That's where I think you're wrong. Once she's elected, for all four years, her incentive is to support him because she's not going to supplant him on the ticket four years down the road, Okay. He, and so he's going to run again on the Democratic ticket, and if he doesn't win that time, her chances of getting it four years after that decline. It's that simple. Well, first, not completely clear she wouldn't try to supplant him on the ticket. Look at Edward Kennedy. If Edward Kennedy were Jimmy Carter's vice president, would he not have tried to supplant him? No, I think he would have. Well, if, if you posit some sort of irrational reptilian motivation, maybe, but I'm talking about in terms of game theory, and I think the Clintons are very rational people, um, once he's in the White House, she has the motivation to support him. What if his health care if is a complete failure and, sh and they have a big fight over which strategy to pursue? He pursues his strategy. It fails. She can legitimately say, if you pursued my strategy, it would have been a different outcome. 
But if there would be there would be the temptation for short term if, jockeying just just because we what, all want to be displayed in a positive light every he, day. But what, I still say her rational incentive would be to do nothing to undermine his his chances of being reelected. What if he withdraws from Iraq precipitously and Hillary opposes it and it, it, the result is a debacle? Wouldn't she want to disassociate herself from the debacle? Answer: Yes, she would. Uh, so it, I, 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 that was, I thought that was the fatal flaw in Beckel's piece. And the but why wouldn't that be true of any other vice president? Because other vice presidents are, 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 don't have the independent base from which they could challenge Obama the way Hillary does. Uh, yeah, so you're thinking there's Evan, a realistic. You're, you're thinking there's really a, a scenario where the vice president challenges the president for the nomination, or distances herself, or quibbles. You know, he can't. She's the only person he can't fire. So if she distances herself or snipes at him, he, there's nothing he can do about it. Uh, yeah, but, but Mickey, but Mickey, if she's not going to challenge him for the nomination in four years, then my question remains, how is her motivation different from any other vice president's motivation? They would all want to right, distance they, themselves they, they from failures. Have, they don't all have the capacity that she has. Suppose he dumps her from the ticket, and she can run four years later. She's preserved her reputation. They don't all have that, that credibility, I think anybody credible who's ambition. Vice I think anybody who's vice president is a viable contender for the presidency later. Anyway, anyway, so the, I, I, I the, think that's the. I think there are a lot of reasons he's probably not going to go for her. He doesn't. But, the idea of Bill and her at the convention outshining him, he finds threatening, probably, or at least you know just arousing the energy right. they'd arouse. Right. I I I, uh, I think there are a lot of reasons but, he won't, in fact, do it. But, but the, the weird thing is, she's. It's either her or a man. She's sort of taken all the other women out of consideration. Well, he, no, people mention Janet, whatever, Napolitano. Right, and but, they but, mention but, Kathy, whatever. But, but, but you know, but, so, but then why not Hillary? If he, if he picks a, a, a woman, what's wrong with Hillary? I mean, I, I, I think people, somehow this meme has caught hold that any other woman would be a diss to Hillary, whereas a man would, you know, well, then, you know, then, it, then it's not a diss to Hillary. I don't quite understand it. I agree, but that seems well, to be no, the way it's, people it's think. Not, no, the idea is, is the idea is that her base is outraged partly out of kind of feminist motivation. This was their moment to get a woman, right? And and so the logic is that picking a woman would uh, would partly appease them. Probably wrong. You may be right, but that's the logic. Right, but the logic is that they're also like Hillary, and it's sort of a diss to Hillary not to pick her. I mean, I think it's crazy, but you know. Yeah, in a way you're right. In a way you're right. Picking a woman who's not Hillary is in a way dissing her, I guess. So. Moving to the men, I mean, I have a favorite candidate, okay? My, my, my usual favorite candidate is Rendell. I've talked to people. They say, well, he's great, but, you know, he has a slight Bill Richardson problem in his past. Uh, and What's that? Womanizing or what? Uh, yeah. And this is what they So you're saying Richardson has that problem, too? Yes. I guess. Yes. I guess I can conclude I don't that. think Richardson vets. Uh, but, um... And, uh, Nikki, I mean, you can't throw around these vague euphemisms. I mean, either say it or don't. I thought I said it. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, so my new candidate is my other perennial favorite, which is General Zinni. Great, General Zinni? Great guy. I, and I heard he was, like, on the list. So, you know, if well, he's on the list, hey, he, you know, he'd be the he'd be now, so, General Zinni total was winner. He was a Colin Powell kind of, like, protege or subordinate, right? Yeah, I don't know if he, I'd call him a Colin Powell protege. He, he, was, he was the Middle East troubleshooter for a while. He developed the plan to occupy Iraq that they ignored. He was an opponent of the war, but a supporter of the surge. So he got both of those right, as opposed to somebody like Chuck Hagel, uh, who got both of those wrong, or Joe Klein. Uh, and uh, and, and he's, the press loves him, which I think is always a good sign. He's very plain spoken. He's, he's Italian, so I assume he's Catholic. He's a very cosmopolitan. I mean, he's like a man of the world. He wants to make sure his kids know different languages. I mean, he's just not not at all parochial. He's your, I'm he's liking your guy. this idea. He's, I haven't heard this idea, but I'm liking it. Has this gotten a lot of play? Sorry? Has this idea gotten a lot of play? No, I don't think so. That's why I'm throwing it out. He, in the past, has said, no, what, you know, what, what part of no don't you understand? But that was, you know, years ago. I haven't seen him say no recently. I like this idea. Uh, you know, he, he's a nominal. He was a Republican, so he'd have to switch. But no, that what, makes it even better. What the hell? It makes it even better. I agree. The uh, plus, in a way, the more unlike Hillary he is, in a certain sense, the less disrespect is is showered on her, according to your prior analysis, kind of right. 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 And he's 
It's like has, Hillary. You just weren't a general. We love you, baby, but you didn't. You didn't have the stars. Right. And he, um, he, 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 he's the rarity, which is he, he's a general who doesn't speak in military ease. He sort of speaks in understandable. I like phrases. all this. You know who uh, Matt Cooper and Ben Smith. You know whose name they bandied about on Blogging Heads TV only like yesterday. They bandied about Colin Powell, but uh, right. That didn't ha quite make sense. The all black ticket that. You know, I don't know. Doubling down, as they put it. <laughs> right, right. Well, Clinton famously doubled down on youth and picked Al Gore, and that worked. But I don't think doubling down on African Americans is is. Yeah, although Colin, Colin Powell, you know, seems whiter than some black people. Well, Culturally, he's more white than Barack Obama. Did he really? Obama, has so. he really covered himself with glory? I mean, he screwed up. Well, that's a question. He screwed his, up. His, his Iraq legacy is pretty ambiguous. Uh, now, he did, on the other hand. He was uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs when, when we had our last war that everyone considers a success, so he oversaw that. No, he screwed that one up, too. That's the point. He screwed up both Iraq wars. He screwed up the Persian Gulf War? Yeah, because he was the one lobbying to end it after 100 hours. If we, if we kept going and, and, and you know, defeated a few more battalions of Republican guards, maybe Saddam would have been Everything would have been wonderful, because I think the last five years has shown, Mickey, that it's a great idea to invade Baghdad with no preparations for no, actually occupying had, it. Yeah, that would have gone great. What a I'm, great I'm idea, not, Mickey. I'm not saying invade Baghdad. I'm saying we were engaging the Republican guards on the battlefield. We let them go instead of fighting them. And, uh, and uh, they, as a result, went back to Iraq and were instrumental in, in restoring Saddam's rule over the Shiites in the south. So they, you would have bombed so, them for like 48 hours longer. Yeah, or yeah, a week longer. This uh, this idea that we have a gimmick at the ending the war in a hundred hours was insane. Well, you, you, you didn't have a week. They were streaming back into Baghdad by car, I think. And, and no, it was like, we had we thought we'd close the back door of them. If, we, if we'd actually closed the back door, then you know they could they could have surrendered, but they weren't about to surrender. I, I think your chances of really killing large numbers of human beings with with bombs. Is not it's not as easy as you think. I think. I, don't I mean, know. what it, it, it seems their tactic tends to be dispersal in the face of it that seems, kind of thing. It seems clear to me that that's what Barry McCaffrey was trying to do. Remember, he was accused of of, of waging the war too aggressively toward the mm -hmm. end. He clearly thought they'd called it off too quickly, and he wanted to, to basically wipe out as many of, Saddam, as, of Saddam's elite shock troops before they went home and became mass murderers, which they did. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, well. We'll never know what would have happened. But anyway, I don't think Colin Powell, I don't think history is on his side here. Um, they also threw out Bill Bradley. You totally, you totally discard that possibility, right? Totally. I mean, is this, he's, you know, the, one thing we've learned is that candidates really, I, I mean, I hate, there's nothing more overrated than uh, people who are comfortable in their own skin. I mean, think of all the people who are uncomfortable in their own skin who've contributed to humanity more than the people who are comfortable in their own skin. But it does, so you think it does seem to me that when we vote for somebody or fall in love with somebody, we tend to want people who are comfortable in their own skin. Bradley seems lugubrious. He, does not, he, he seems to be, have an existential crisis, perhaps a valid existential crisis, uh, every day on the campaign trail. And, and the voters sense that. They don't sense that he's comfortable. And, and he's also not smart. And the, you know, the press hates him. So I don't, you know. He's not smart? Well, his scores came out, remember? They were awful. Oh, his SATs. And so the judge of a person's intelligence no, is, is their SAT scores? That's no, the gauge? No, I don't think that's right. But, but it, it, that pricked the bubble of the paradigm that, oh, Bill Bradley is so smart. And started, hey, maybe I this see. guy's not so smart. Maybe he's a jock who got into Princeton on an athletic scholarship because he's one of the greatest basketball players in the world. And the bottom line is his SAT scores were lower than Mickey's. So he shouldn't be president. His SAT, Mickey, his SAT I mean, scores were doesn't lower. Doesn't that rule almost everyone out? I mean, honestly, Mickey, if a president has to have SAT scores higher than yours, would we even have a president? You don't even know, such a thing possible? You don't even know what mine were. They weren't that hot. But they, Bradley's SAT scores were way lower than George W. Bush's. I uh, refuse to believe that. It's true. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, so, okay, well, listen. My final question is just... 
Evan Bai is one of those people I know nothing about because the only thing I ever hear about him is what a fine candidate he would make. You well, never hear about anything he actually does, just what a fine candidate. He's much better spoken than I expected. I thought he was a soporific bore, and the times I've seen him on television, he's been reasonably lively. I don't know. But I think I, I would not like him as much as Zinni. That's I, what I, I think. I, I know. I, I, as Vinny? Oh, as Zinni, yeah. General the, Zinni. The, um, you know, the only thing I know about Bai is that his father wrote the only constitutional amendment that has a typographical error in it. So I've, I've never venerated Birch Bai. I don't understand Birch. where the greatness of Birch Bai comes from. He was a stupid constitutional amendment, too, quite apart from the typo, was the. The, the amendment that says, oh, hey, we can elect a president if he has 40% of the vote. Um, hmm. Anyway. Sounds like that amendment could use a typographical error. <laughs> well, it didn't. I don't think the typographical error helped. Um, hmm. But anyway, and they complain about blogs. Ha. Huh. Really? Um, so anyway, uh, Zinni. Okay, so Zinni, so you and I are, are, are down for the, the Zinni thing. Yeah. It's Obama, Zinni, 08. Obama, Zinni, Better Winnie, something like that. Or, uh, that's really good. I'm sure we'll see that on a bumper sticker soon. Or, what's his first name, Anthony? Yes. So, like, what, Barack and Tony? I don't know. I'm not seeing anything. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. We're for, we're for, for it. Rain. Um, we're for it. Uh, so. Hey, speaking of Obama. Yeah. In your blog, I saw your, your topmost item disses him for the way he responded to this Scarlett Johansson thing. I mean, in our last episode of Blogging Heads, I was generously offering to uh, provide Scarlett Johansson with guidance and counseling to help her understand why Barack Obama was returning her emails. Right. And, and Obama said, oh, I only returned one email, and now, I've, and now people think I have a, some sort of relationship, implying that, implying that you know, she with some sort of fantasist exaggerating their relationship in, in, in a way that I thought was needlessly uh, sort of disparaging of her. I mean, she's a big supporter. Yeah, a good politician doesn't disparage supporters. Well, he, he said something like what? He said, like, I return one email and all of a sudden I'm, like, in a correspondence with her or something yeah, like, like that. Right? like she's, like, some sort of fantasy stalker or something. It, it, was, it was insane. And but see, I think this is you policy. trying gratuitously to... Uh, do him damage because I, I think what happened oh. is you're assuming that somebody went to him and said Scarlett Johansson says this what do you have to say I don't think that's what happened I think the press just asked him about it and said what's this we hear about blah 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 so what he was saying is the media is making more of this than there is I think that's what he meant and and maybe he should have thought wait a second people may think I'm I'm, I'm dissing Scarlett or something, he, maybe he should have, but he, well, I don't think it was obvious to him from the question he, he, that, it, that his answer would be interpreted in that well, in the first, way you're interpreting I'm, it. I'm not trying to diss Obama, I'm trying to get cheap hits for my website by putting the name Scarlett in the headline. Okay, so ah, that's what's going big on. Google that's search term. That's what's going on there. The, yeah. But it also seemed to me that, you know, she said there were multiple emails and they were lengthy and useful. He, he made a point of saying it was only one and just said thank you. He knows what she said. Why did he have to gratuitously contradict her? Uh, right. it, 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 the way it was set up by the press, and I think he should have known whether or not this was the actual question, was she said this, but he says this. That's yeah. the way it was set up in the story. It was just, it was weirdly inept, unless there's something else going on, like Michelle really was annoyed at the implication that he was paying well, too much attention. I can imagine that it wouldn't thrill her, Scarlett actually. So, I, I can imagine that, and he does yeah. want to stay on good terms with her. Yeah, so th th there may have been some... Something that explained the inexplicable clumsiness, but but you know your claim that you're not trying to gratuitously damage him. I'm about to completely puncture for all time. Okay. Here's another I, item in your blog. I'm going to eat a piece of pizza while you're doing that to um to distract. That's great television. Go ahead. Attention. In fact, maybe I should pause and so no, people gonna, just have to I'm focus gonna, on the visual. I'm going to cover up the lens so you don't see this disgusting spectacle. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Do you know what item I'm about to mention on your blog that was just totally gratuitous Obama damage? No, I don't. Okay, here's, this, here's the totality of your blog entry. I didn't realize Obama went to the Million Man March, and then you hyperlink Million Man March, and people can go learn that he, in fact, went. Right. That's the totality of your blog entry, Mickey. Correct. So you're just trying to spread what you know will, in some circles, be damaging information. Why? You, you add nothing to it. You have nothing to say about it. 
I mean, what other blog item have you begun with the words, I didn't realize that X, and then oh, said nothing it. else? Have you ever done that before? I think so, but I didn't know what to think about it. I, I don't hold the Million Man March against him, I don't think. On the other hand... I mean, hand, I bet there are a lot of things every day you find out that you didn't know before, but you don't really make a habit of putting them on your blog. Well, if they're, and, as, if they're as interesting as that... What's interesting about it? Is it, in fact, damaging to... Well, it, we don't know, but it's an interesting area to investigate. It I, I, I didn't occur to me that he had been on the Million Man March. Well, why don't you... I mean, um, you know what the Million Man March was. Why don't you give it some thought? I and went, think if, you, if it does, in fact, work to his discredit, and if it know, does, explain a, why. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say it was terrible. I'm a, I'm a blogger. I try to steer my readers right. to interesting things. This was an interesting thing. They can make up their own mind. When I make and up the, my mind, the, I'll blog the, about that. And the fact is, you know, there is no good rational argument for why it should discredit him. But you also know that if you help get it out there, there's lots of irrational people who, who will think it is to his discredit. Well, it, it fits with the whole black identity fixation that I think is kind of productive. Well, anyway, interestingly, when I clicked on the hyperlink in your blog and went to the Million Man March, the message I got, presumably from Firefox, was the website at www w.spectator.org has been reported as an attack site and has been blocked based on your security preferences. Listen to this. Some, it, said, it went on to say, some attack sites intentionally distribute harmful software or harmful information abetted by Mickey Cows. It didn't say that part. I'm adding that. Uh, well, you're, you should, uh, you're supplying the fairness doctrine with the cleanliness doctrine. Um, obviously, the, you know, the site, you know, some Obama proponents are screwing up the spectator site, so... Yeah, well, it's, and you're. I doubt well, it was overloaded by the li the people I sent to to that link. So, hmm. uh, it it anyway. E e either he did go or he didn't go. I don't know. Maybe it's in his book. Maybe he explains why he went in his book. I went to the march. It wasn't. The, it wasn't. The, I didn't think it was a oh, horrible. Oh, I didn't know that Mickey Kaus went well, to the Million know. Man March. I don't think I was. I went. I don't think I was exactly welcome. I was just went to check it out and see what it was like. It was pretty unbelievable, actually. I've never seen so many people on the mall. It was shocking. Well, Farrakhan's speech was also memorable. Right, but this is... The part where he went into numerology. Right, right, right. But I... Um, but, you know, I, um, I I went before Farrakhan spoke, I think. Uh, ah. It was just well, an unbelievable... Maybe Barack was interested it was a in strange, the non-Farrakhan part, It was too. a strange... Yeah, absolutely. It was a strange <laughs> vibe. It was... I assume that every black politician in America sort of had to go. But well, that makes it a, a, a sufficiently unremarkable fact that the person might well be excused for not putting it on his blog. Well, that's not what I thought. I thought it was still sufficiently yeah. remarkable. So you thought basically every black politician had to go to the Million Man March, but you were so shocked by the fact that Barack Obama, black well, politician, Well, I don't think went. the Million Man March has that horrible connotations. I mean, didn't Spike Lee make a movie about it that portrayed it as relatively benign? I mean, it's not... It, 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 you know, Farrakhan lucked onto a, a, a you know, the, a, a total sweet spot of an admirable purpose that everybody in the black community, or black men thought they needed a moment where they, where they, you know, reaffirmed their responsibilities. That's nothing wrong with that. Don't tell me. So, tell the people who will follow your link and be irrationally outraged by what they see. They might, they might not. Um, so, uh... And so we were going to talk about this time story a little, New York yeah, Times story. Yeah, there, there's. A, go ahead. You no, you go it. ahead. I've been doing too much talking. I'm like. No, quite I'm the like, contrary. I'm not like, enough. I'm like Charlie Rose here. No, it's, no, uh, you're like uh, better Charlie Rose than Charlie Black. Well, so I don't know. First, Charlie Black. I, you know, he made this terrorist comment. I don't know why Democrats want to get rid of Charlie Black. He's doing a terrible job as McCain's campaign manager. Are they trying to hound him? We should say, you know, he's the one who said in, a, in some interview for, by, with Fortune magazine that uh, a terrorist attack would be a great thing for John McCain, basically. Um, right. And, 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 and people are trying to use this thing, demanding that McCain fire him. Uh, and, you know, why, you know, that, that gives him a, a week of good publicity at most, or bad publicity for McCain. And then McCain replaces Black with Mike Murphy, who will do a much better job. So, and whom you know personally. I do know I do know him personally, and, and he, there've, already, there've, there've already been rumors in the New York Times that he's met with McCain. Actually, reports that he's met with McCain. So he, so, he'd be the logical McCain... guy for McCain to turn to, and you know he's very good, and probably will do a better job than 
than Charlie Black. So Safe to say, just based on the one quote of Black's I've heard. <laughs> well, McCain's campaign it hasn't been very good so far, has it? No. He's going to get the votes in Mexico and Colombia soon. But so. he hasn't fired Black yet, right? No. Uh, hmm. But anyway. Um, That's an interesting insight you just gave uh, us. Well, I was going to blog it, but I gave it to Blogging Heads first, knowing that it will take you a full day to... you got time. you got time <laughs> before take we you post. A full day to post it, and I'll beat you, yeah. Um, so, so, go ahead. Describe this torture article. Well, it was just a reported piece about the interrogation, mainly about the interrogation of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11, by his own account, at least. Um, and... Uh, it was just kind of interesting. It didn't come down clearly on one side or the other of the torture debate, I would say. The interrogator himself practiced no torture, and they had, and they had examples when, uh, in the piece of interrogations that had been very successful without any torture. On the other hand, in this case, uh, uh, Muhammad had been uh, softened up, as they say, with the following things that I think amount to torture, using, as they put it, cold temperatures, sleeplessness, pain, and fear. Uh, at least that was characteristic of the CIA program that, that he was subjected to. He, he was waterboarded a um, hundred times, according to the article. That too. After but some people, claim, some people claim that's not torture, right? Well, how bad could waterboarding be if you can do it a hundred times and live? After, uh, after a while... Well, wait a second. John McCain endured something that was surely torture and right. supposedly said nothing? Are I you saying right. that John McCain is lying? No, I'm not. I'm no. I'm, and, I, and I think it's a. I, I, it seems to me waterboarding probably is torture. But um, there is this interesting possibility: is if you can do something that really is like flipping on a light switch, that you know administers pain that is well, so that's effective. From, that, that's that is, a quote from the piece. Right. That's so effective and lasts so briefly that maybe it's not torture. That's what they hold out waterboarding as. And I guess if you have to do it a hundred times, it's not that. It's not that easy. But now, um, this was. But this was the the ambiguity in the piece. Did you get this about Abu Zubay, Zubaydah, the Palestinian? It, did, it didn't say whether he was waterboarded or not. Well, what it said about him seemed contradictory, although I guess if you put it in a certain chronological sequence, it's not. It, sa it said, first, he's the guy who led them to Muhammad, okay? He was the al-Qaeda logistics guy. It says, senior Federal Bureau of Investigation officials thought such methods, that is, all forms of torture, unnecessary and unwise. Their agents got Abu Zubaydah talking without the use of force, and he revealed the central role of Mr. Muhammad in the 9-11 plot. But then they, later, they say later he is subjected, the same guy is subjected to torture, and that's when the guy says it was like flipping a switch. You know, he started cooperating. Well, if he had already given him Muhammad's name, he was already in a pretty cooperative mood, I'd say. But anyway, so, so that part is not clear. Is but it Zubaydah or, or Muhammad where they say it was like flipping a switch? I'm almost positive it's Zubaida. I'm not, but anyway, we should check. You're not. Um, but we'll, we'll link and let our viewers uh, the, declare me correct. The, or not. Um, uh, it, 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 that, would explain, was, that would explain what I thought was, was mistaken, if, if yeah. I misread this. I thought the piece was going to vindicate the, the Frank Gibney point of view that you don't need torture to get the truth. In fact, torture is counterproductive because it forces people to tell lies to keep the torturers happy. Uh, it didn't do that because all the examples that it, that it had, except for Zubaida, according to you, uh, well, they, they didn't know. There, there definitely is that paragraph about Zubaida uh, saying that, that he gave the most crucial information to that. them without torture. I missed that. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, but you, you can't run an experiment where you don't torture KSM and, and see what he says. Uh, I, I took this as a struggle between the FBI and the CIA. The FBI takes the position you say, which is we don't need torture. The CIA takes the position where, you know, they're torn, but they have done torture, and uh, and this was the CIA getting its story out to counter the FBI, which so far has been dominating the discussion. Uh, and it's okay, a mixed, well, and it's a aside, mixed story. Let's, I, I've never denied that torture could conceivably work under some circumstances. Let's assume that it was crucial in, the, in, the, in, in opening uh, KSM up himself. Would you say then that it was a good idea to torture him, what they did? Well, you mean in, in general or in terms of the specific no, in this case, No, in this case, did they do the right thing? Well, in retrospect, no, because he doesn't seem to have given us any pretty valuable information and he blackened our image around the world. But if, if, if in fact, he gave us some information that we don't know about, like they were playing to nuke Chicago or something, then yes. 
I think at the very outset of the piece, it suggests he gave us some useful information. Right, um, but he, he, mainly, he mainly seemed to assuage our fears that there were a bunch of other plots in the works that we didn't know about. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but he gave us the information that he killed Daniel Pearl. Right. Although, from his point of view, I think that was almost like boasting. Uh, right, but e even that, that information wouldn't justify blackening America's image around the world. Well, uh, if we had gotten useful information, I, I mean, tell me this, how, how useful would the information, what kind of information would have justified what we did? I don't know, but, but again, since we would never know in advance whether he was going to give us information, that's not really a fair way to judge whether we should torture people or not. Well, um, that's kind of a problem with, your, with your, your general contention that it's justified in some cases. I mean, how do you know when it is? Right, we have to make a judgment. It's not, but my point is, it's not a, it's not necessarily a black mark if you don't get sufficient information from somebody. If there was reason to suspect that, you know, in, in this person, if if there were hundreds such people, that if you, you know, that it it, it would be worth it in in the long run. And uh, so, I don't think you can make that that make that many conclusions from just this one case. Uh, but you can in imagine this, information we could have gotten from him that would have. Yes. What, like retroactively justified it, so then it would no, have been okay? No, not retroactively just there, you One can't imagine information that would in general justify a policy of torturing people in that position, a small, so even if group you, of people in that position. So even if, I mean, in the past you've said it's the ticking time bomb scenario. This was not that. I mean, no, they, for all be, they knew, there could be a ticking time bomb somewhere, but they had no particular reason to believe yeah, there no, was or that this, he had the key. I don't think this was the ticking time bomb situation. Okay, so in this case, you would say what they did was wrong and, and should not I, be legal under American law, the way they treated KSM. I actually don't know. I, I, all I can say is that if it shouldn't be, if, you shouldn't, you, if it shouldn't be legal, we shouldn't do it. I don't buy your, your scenario. We've been through this where you say it's illegal, but we should do it anyway. Um, no, that's not my, I mean, that's not my view. My view is we should never do it. Okay. It you, should not be at theory, least. It should not be is, legal is your, under any circumstances. Your, and if the circumstances are ever so extraordinary that, like the president thinks it has to be done, well, then he can put on his job on the line and do something illegal. Is it your, but, your, but it should it, be illegal. Is it your theory that there are no circumstances in which you know we capture Osama bin Laden and we have reason to think that there are plots in the works? There are no circumstances where torture could be justified. That aren't the. That, my that view is that the law. My the view is that the law bomb? should be. That it is never legal, and then, and I can imagine circumstances where, if I were president or something, or if I were, you know, director of the CIA, I would say, you know, look, I, I, I'm, I'm the one who goes to jail for this. If that's the judgment society renders, but we have to do it, fine. I think that's. But that should be. I think that's silly. Look, the law should conform to morality. Well, law. I mean, law never perfectly conforms no, to morality. I mean. If uh, you know, if you if if someone's dying outside a pharmacy in a classic case, and you know the medicine is inside, but you have to break in to get it, you say you say don't don't break in. Well, I think that that is that is justified by an actual official doctrine of necessity. So I don't think it would be illegal to break in. Well, suppose, I mean, I'm not sure that's the case. Actually, I just think it's the case that a jury would let you off, and th and th and that's what would happen with truly justified torture even if torture is illegal across the board, yeah. see. But anyway, I mean, what it, I want to know from you is, okay. There are plenty of ways to do it. You could say that, you know, it's limited to th three cases and the president has to certify and, the th you know, that there are all sorts of checks and balances. You know, there, 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 there are ways to carve out an actual legal exception. You just don't want them because you don't want to lose the propaganda value of pretending that we do something that we don't do, um, which is never torture. Well, I, I, I would say, um, well, I mean, let me ask you this. If it's true, suppose they had gotten from, from Z Zubai, whatever his name is, if they had gotten uh, KSM's identity from him through torture, then would the torture be, be uh, justified because it led us to the mastermind and we at least got him arrested? Pretty close, yeah, I think it might be. Well, so that's not ticking time bomb at all. You're changing your position. No, no, I, I, my position has been that there are cases other than the ticking time bomb where, where torture might be justified. Oh, I thought you were strictly a ticking time bomb guy. No, I said that so this is So case, what, are the, what are the other cases? I don't know. I haven't thought about it, but it seems to me that finding the mastermind in 9-11 is probably one of them. Hmm. 
Interesting. It's, it's certainly for waterboarding. I, mean, I don't know. There, there, there's some forms of torture that are way more so, grotesque So locating than waterboarding. masterminds Water, justifies waterboarding. waterboarding. Locating masterminds for a, a crime that killed 3,000 people and where there are other plots that might be in the works? Yes. Okay, well, that, I think that's an expansion of your previous position. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not a presidential candidate. I'm not, the, tracking my positions isn't worth doing. Okay, but you're still saying that even by your expanded position, it was not right to torture KSM, which they did. So, I mean, In so retrospect, you think it looks like it wasn't worth it. Whether that means that if you have KSM... You know, if you have, uh, if Man, you, you if just you, sound an awful fuzzy. I mean, you, nothing like a legal doctrine could emerge from the way you're approaching this, Mickey. I'm sorry. I mean, you went to Harvard Law School, no, and you're just you giving did, us all this you, mushy stuff. It's not it's mushy. Like, it's not mushy. You know, no I'll way know it when I see it. We'll ask Mickey afterwards just, if it was justified. No, you, we, you know, have you know, some bright whole, lines Bob, here? My whole point is that you can't decide whether it's justified beforehand by looking at like, what the results were afterwards. Since So there's no way, <laughs> there's no way the people deciding whether to torture can know whether they're on the right side of the law according to the legal doctrine you favor. No, There's my, nothing for them to consult. No, my legal doctrine would, would, would there be, you know, some criteria and there would be some mechanism for having an ex, a formal exception to the general no torture ban that would not leave it to the unilateral discretion of the president and would not allow him to expand it beyond a handful of cases. And if you invoke that procedure, you would be following the law and doing the right thing. And if you didn't invoke that procedure, you wouldn't be, whether you got information from the guy you tortured or you didn't get information. Okay. But you can't judge it. I mean, it seems an obvious common sense point that you can't judge whether it was right beforehand in hindsight by looking at what happened afterwards. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't work. No, I, I think it should be the rule. The, the law should be such that you know before you commit an You have grounds for deciding for sure before you do something, whether it's legal or illegal. No, that's right. I mean, come on. That's, that's right. the way it's got to be. That's right. No, we, we agree on that. You just would. But you say it depends on what the consequences of the interrogation turn out to be? No, no, whether, I, said, I said exactly. Whether the decision to torture was legal or not? I said exactly the opposite of that, Bob. Oh. I said okay. it has to be. Never mind. It, it has to be. Legal or illegal by the, the, the whatever the conditions and criteria and procedures are before you decide to do it. You can't judge it by the outcome. That's what I was okay, saying. Okay, and in some future blogging heads, you will lay out some criteria. No, possibly. I, torture is not my business. I just oh, think you're. Oh, come on. You're I a pundit. You, you're, you have to opine on everything. Your position is ridiculous public relations hypocrisy. You want to say we don't torture while the reality would be that we would torture on the grounds that the world would be gullible enough to believe the letter of the law and not the substance of what we do. Well, my position is clear, if nothing else, and I'm not sure we can say that about yours. No, you're... you're so we, if you can just we clarify both have, yours... We both have procedures. Your procedure is the president violates the law and throws himself on the mercy of the jury, and the jury is the ultimate arbiter. Fine. That's a procedure. It's clear. My, I would have a different procedure that was perhaps more sensible than that. Perhaps, if we knew what it was, and maybe you'll tell like, us why not, have the, why not have the jury decide before we torture? And why not have the jury made up of experts uh, who, who would have a, a make, uh, impose a reasonable check on the president before we did it, as opposed to having the president actually go to trial after we did it? Okay, but they would still need some criteria, and that's yeah. what you may or may not give us in the future. My, but my final question is, uh, given the fact that even by your own account, what, torturing KSM in this case was not justified, was not justified in your view. Should the evidence generated no, I, I, through his testimony be admissible in court? I actually didn't say it wasn't justified. I said that if you look at the results, they certainly don't justify it from what we know. So torturing. you have no position but on that's whether That's not how you make the moral judgment as to whether it's justified. No, I, I don't have any position. Man, you are I getting really squishy, Mickey. They're close this cases. Is like, Just because they're close cases doesn't mean you're squishy. This is the only good evidence that's, I've ever seen it, that you're a liberal is just that there's this squishiness about it's your not worldview. Squishy. It's one of the things you learn in law school. Banana is a hard word. You never know when to stop it. You've got to stop somewhere. What's a hard word? Banana. Or Mississippi. <laughs> uh, you know, that reminds me. <laughs> I, I think in a way, well, never mind. We've done enough on torture. We'll save that for next week. I'm sure people will look forward to it. Actually, they could show this tape as, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, as, and that would force, yeah. Worse than water. Like a light switch. Worse than water. Like a light switch. Um, um, okay, so should we move quickly to some comments? Sure. 
quickly. The commenter Lord Baltimore, who I assume is not to be confused with the commenter Baltimoreon, very different vibe you get from Lord Baltimore. I mean, then from just a name compared to Baltimoreon. Um, it expresses disappointment in me because notwithstanding my supposed background in evolutionary psychology, I seemed unaware that the latest research clearly shows that people react much more negatively to a potential loss than they react positively to a potential gain. Now, this is in the context of the social security argument and the question of whether you would alienate more people from supporting social security by means testing the benefits in the end or by raising their social security taxes, right? Right. And this guy is saying that there's evidence, for example, gamblers value the chance to avoid losing $100 more highly than the chance to make $100. Now, if that's true, okay, as he says, people react more negatively to a potential loss than positively to a potential gain. What side of the argument does that come down? No, they're both, they're both lost, so it's just one is off in the future and one is immediate. And right, my, but in terms of people, is, the way people think about it and react emotionally to it, apparently losing $100 means more to them than gaining 100 would. Right, and, and but I, I think that that's true. But it's an opposite in this case. The, the the whether you tax the rich or deny them future benefits, those are both negative things. You're, they're both costs. You're well, taking, of course, they're negative. But you're but, taking but, something away. Well, here's what puzzles me: is I mean, which side of the argument would you? Th so you don't think this comes down on either side of the argument? No, I, I assume he, I assume he meant it came down on my side. But I, I'm and not, your side is what? My my side is that. It, Rich people would prefer to lose their future benefits through means testing than endure the high taxes that would be necessary to give them benefits, as Obama proposes to do. You know, oddly, he agrees with you on this implication, and I don't get that. I mean, it seems to me... No, I don't think that's the implication of what he said. I just think that's what oh, I think. Oh, right, exactly. That's what you asked me what my side was. My side is that rich don't right. like to be and, and so his findings should work against your side, right? I don't think his findings affect my side one or the other. They're both things you're taking out. I call what he says the takeaway principle, which is in politics it's always, already, always harder to take something away from somebody than not to give it to them in the first place. And that accords with what he says about human nature. But it doesn't apply to this case because rich people expect to get their money and they expect to get their Social Security benefits. <coughs> so you're taking something away from them either way. Well, anyway, puzzlingly, he seems to have thought that this finding straightforwardly supported your view, which I don't quite see. But Well, maybe he just thought that you were wrong about evolutionary psychology, but anyway. Yes. Could be. Um, you know, we've long been looking for a motto for Blogging Heads TV. Vero Pasimus. What? Oh, the thing on Obama's seal? Yes. Yeah, fire the guy who thought that up, man. I'm with you there. Unless it was Obama. Do we know who the guy was? Or, no, or Obama's press secretary to declined to say whose idea it was. You know, there's been an absence of good reporting on a lot of these issues in terms of who thought up what stupid idea within these various well, there's campaigns. Well, no, there's no infighting on Obama's campaign, so it's very hard to do. Ah, that's interesting. That's, uh, that, the, you, you get that stuff with Hillary because they all hate each other and they're dropping the goods on each other. Fascinating. A reporter's nightmare, a cohesive campaign. Yeah, no. <clears throat> the, um, anyway, um, no, that's not the motto. Uh, and oh, come on, does not nominate a motto, but I picked one out of her uh, comment. So she says, I have set up a large kiddie pool under the trees in my yard. Each evening I set my laptop in a chair, grab a glass of wine, and watch videos or BHTV. And she writes, white trash meets the Internet age. Uh, That's it, right? Well, it's pretty good. It doesn't quite apply to some of our bloggers. No, I know, but overwhelming. I mean, I think we have a majority of, of white bloggers, probably a majority white viewership, and... Uh, let's face it. I mean, the sensibility is a little—it's a little trashy. It's definitely trashy. I had somebody complain to me that that um, we should redo the graphics because it looked like smug people who thought they knew what they were talking about broadcasting from their basement. Wait, it looked like what people? Smug. What was the first part? The basement part. I'm, I'm totally in favor of. What was the first part? Smug. 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 S M U G. Well, what what is it about the aesthetics that would make them smug? I mean, either they're smug or they're not. Well, because they think they're so smart that they can broadcast from their basement, and they're so, so much smarter than Chris. That's they're a so pretty much, strained interpretation. So much, so much smarter than Chris Matthews, you know, who goes into a studio, and yet even from their basement they can beat him. I don't know. It's it's. 
I, I, my, if my he's so was, smart, if he's so smart, how come he's not replacing Tim Russert to meet the press, huh? Um, there are plenty of good reasons for that, but um, it. Uh, I thought her. I thought that is what blogging heads looked like, but I didn't see any solution for it. No, quite the contrary. We're going to heighten the contradictions. And be smugger. And be smugger. It. Okay. No, it's it's. Uh, if you yeah, never mind. I won't get into it. Okay. Sometimes I gotta say it looks a little too basementy even for me. I mean, I don't look like I'm in the basement. I, as I say, I look like I'm in the underworld. Right now. Yeah. I expect Chi underworld in, in the ancient Greek sense of the place people go after they die. Or? Yeah, I expect Chi Chiron or whoever the the boat guy is to come and take me away any minute now. You still blue? I think I'm still blue. Uh -huh. It's too bad. Um, <laughs> anyway. Quickly, Uncle Ebenezer says that. Says Bob, you realize you're only reinforcing the ivory tower charges that people undoubtedly like to fling at you by showing very little interest in sports except for golf and tennis. A, I have gone through my phases of infatuation with baseball, basketball, and football when I was younger, right? And, and even played some of them. But mainly, I just want to think golf gets a bad rap. You should be a fan if you understood the game in all its dimensions. You would be a fan of it on grounds that it increases social equality because. Although what you hear about is the country clubs, there are tons of municipal courses, public courses, and if you go play there, you will see a broader diversity of people than you'll see just about anywhere. I used to, uh, in, when we lived in Washington, I played uh, Rock Creek Park a lot, and that was essentially the only time that uh, I interacted with black people who weren't like working, uh, you know, in, in a service job, like at the drugstore or something, right? But more I so mean, than a pickup basketball game. Well, by that time, I was not playing that much pickup basketball. I played a little but, at the Y. You were in no, one or two of those but games. Your, I think. your but, argument is that if you did play pickup basketball, that you w wouldn't hit such a cross section of people. I just don't think that's true. I think you had a big cross section of people playing pickup basketball. It's a different cross section. I mean, I did play pickup until until knee surgery when I was 39, mm -hmm. which came the the need for that uh, was a result of playing basketball. But um, I, that's a different kind of cross section. But no, I'm not saying you. I'm not saying it, it, you get more of a cross section in in golf. But in a way, maybe you do actually come to I think of it. Anyway, said. the point is, golf gets a bad rap. Go play on a municipal but, course. But we just. Uh, I thought the point of our readers was that we were incredibly boring talking about golf. No, I think he, well, that's not the point I, of this I, reader. It's that, it's that, I think I agree it's with that you. I'm sounding elite or elitist or okay. something because these are sports of the rich. Yeah, okay. And then, uh, I don't know, GW Law 99, one of our cherished conservative commenters, gets in an argument with Glau Range, G L A U R U N G E over the legal status of East Jerusalem and just just calls attention to this kind of interesting question of uh, the fact that in, in, in Resolution 242 it, it demands withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict but not from the territories occupied in the recent conflict. Very artful of them. Well, it, it actually was done intentionally. I mean, I mean sure. that was uh, uh, leaving the out was something uh, Israel wanted, no, and sure. so, well, so it's it's not. I, I mean, there is though. On the other hand, the question of if it doesn't mean all the territories, how does it have any meaning at all? Are you saying that technically one square inch would qualify? Well, it leaves it to negotiations. So that's where we are. Yeah, that's that is where we are. Anyway, they had a they had a fruitful exchange. The um, now. Last thing, uh, we're almost at an hour. Are you skeptical of this double-digit lead that Obama has over McCain in polls as I am? Oh, of course, especially... The I, think we're gonna, I think we may see a bigger Bradley effect when Republicans and, and more independents are voting than we saw in the Democratic primaries, right? Uh, sure, although why, okay, why, so would, why would Republicans even tell... Independents might tell voters, tell pollsters they were voting for Well, Obama anyway, I'm saying he needs to have about a 10-point lead going in to feel... Uh, oh, yeah comfortable yeah absolutely okay and and but the la times poll also is unreliable in terms of uh, it's like the newsweek poll that it almost always shows the democrat ahead so okay uh gray davis would be governor if the la times poll was accurate i've always thought his first name was just a major liability <laughs> it's not a good one
Not a good one. Um, but anyway, uh, yes, yeah, so Obama has to lead by 10 so he can win by 3 or 5 or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So I think. Um, but McCain's campaign has been so awful that I think he has a shot at doing that. So. And I'm for Thanks him. to Charlie Black, who and the I'm, Democrats may ill-advisedly hound him into firing. And I'm for him, even even if you and I both snipe at him. Snipe at him Wait, you're for who? Obama. So you got a funny way of showing it, buddy. Uh, you were the one criticizing him last week. Yeah, but in a serious, heartfelt way out of my disappointment in him. Uh, okay. Sorry. It was. It was true. Uh, well, I snipe. It was, it, was, it, was, it was heartfelt disillusionment. I snipe at him in a superficial way designed to get me hits. But it does reflect a weird thing that he would throw this woman who'd done so much for him under the... I'm sorry. It reflects a sort of... It seems oh, to reflect... To, the Scarlett Johansson seems, thing is totally explicable. It's, anyway, your bigger crime is the Million Man March thing. It seems, it seems to be self-centered of him. All he wants to do is get the dirt off his shoulder, and he doesn't care what the dirt feels. There that was a mistake. The, the dirt off the shoulder thing was a mistake, but, 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 but we're running over time here. Okay. All right, next time, you'll be less blue. Let the record show. I want to keep going, but Bob insists on coming No, no, up. I'm game. Bring it on. No, Bring I'm it on. Joking. Nobody's watching at this point anyway. I'm, it's just you and me. It just I'm seems joking. like we could go do it over coffee and it'd be... I'm joking. I'll be less, I'll be less blue next week. Okay. Great. See you. See you around. Okay.